If our nation can be said to have a soul, Her Majesty, for 70 years, has been its guardian angel. I'm Trevor Phillips. I was born at the dawn of the second Elizabethan age. All these children would have grown up with rationing. I've been rediscovering how we lived. Sometimes there weren't enough coal to make a fire, so we had to just sit there and shiver. And a little of how we loved. I went to get up and he went, aren't you going to give me a kiss then? I went, what, after you've had shellfish? I've been looking back at the good times. We all had proper pop out of fizzy bottles, which was posh in those days. And the not so good times. I'd get pulled up two, three times a month. And what's really sad about it, I thought it was normal. Yet through it all, one royal constant. At the same time, a steadfast rock of stability and a mirror of great change in us. Queen Elizabeth II passes from the Abbey, consecrated and dedicated to her life work by the solemn and hallowed ritual of coronation. A mantle almost a thousand years old is laid on the shoulders of a new generation. The young queen will come to reign over the largest empire the world had ever seen. After a bitter war, she had to symbolize both a past and a future of prosperity and peace. And so, this day of days most memorable comes to an end. And with it begins a new era, the new Elizabethan age. Long may she reign. In 1953, few would have pictured Britain as it is now. These are Jamaica, right? Yeah, that you see the After a decade of austerity, my mother agonized about how she'd tell my father that they were about to have another hungry mouth to feed. Uh, I'm going to try them and see what they're like. In the three score and ten years since I was born, that young woman grew in stature to become revered even perhaps loved by her nation. Of course, she changed, as did we, her people. But like Her Majesty, whilst many things about us may have looked different, an awful lot has remained the same. To try to disentangle the old from the new, I've been chatting to pals in London's Brixton, for many emblematic of how far we've come from the days when the empire meant exotic lands across the sea and I've been making some new friends in Bury St Edmunds, whose church spires and neat municipal gardens recall a Britain that some thought was already disappearing 70 years ago. But our journey starts in the former manufacturing powerhouse of Lancashire, where the paradox of continuity and change is at its plainest, so much different, yet so much the same. We've got a box of photographs of Coronation Day on the 2nd of June, 1953. We've got a parade here. So we've got um, the young page boy carrying the crown, and then here comes uh, the queen uh, oh. in the background. But it's kind of a classic northern scene, isn't it? You've got the cobbled streets, the terrace, terrace housing. And here's, and here's the, the coronation of the, of the queen. It's great, she's sitting there on her little throne and... What do you think that the Queen would mean to a street like this? I think there's genuine enthusiasm or strong feeling for this young Queen. But I think it was also about marking the end of something and a new beginning. Things are generally looking better, wages are higher, there's full employment, there's the security of the NHS and the welfare state. They're not only marking the coronation of the Queen, they're marking the beginnings of change, not just in their town, but across the country. If you wanted a job, there was always one available. Bolton stood at the heart of a global industry that would fuel the new Elizabethan age. Into the busy dock end of Liverpool and Manchester come cargoes of raw cotton from the far corners of the world. 
Bolton's merchants grew rich, turning the empire's raw materials into cloth for the growing population. For two decades, much of the country shared its prosperity. Of course, it wasn't shared by everyone. Most people went on the bus, of course, because nobody had any cars. I'd get on the bus on Saturday morning, get off in town, walk through town to the market hall, and uh, we could buy broken biscuits then for so much, say sixpence, something like that. <laughs> that were all we could afford. <laughs> Bolton's women could only dream of buying the dresses made from the cloth they wove, but all the same, they paid a high price. When I left school, I worked in mill for £2.10 a week. Sweat and slave from morning till night to keep me bobbing straight. I changed them with a gadget in case my hands got burned. Never stopping, never stopping, day and night they turned. I pieced a thousand knots a week to keep the yarn a-flowing. And at the end of every day, tired feet were home a-going. I wrote that a long time ago. I started work when I was 15 in the mill, and we had a long way to walk from where I lived. We started at half past seven in the morning, and we had to be there on time, or we got our pay cut. And the pay wasn't much as it was, it was only two pounds. 10 shillings a week, two shillings a week. And I had to give two pound of that to my mother and keep two shillings. So I could go out once a week, that's all. It was so noisy and very, very busy. The uh, machines were going all the time. And that's why I'm a bit deaf, I think. But you had to go whether you wanted or not, because it was your wage. But there was plenty of money in the town, enough to erect and maintain public buildings that rivaled anything down south. Bolton exuded self-confidence and civic pride. Bolton's Art Gallery opened in 1947. Henry Moore's sculptures were purchased. At that period, the 50s, he was like the big public mm. figure in British art. Barbara Hetworth sculptures were purchased, and then works by the younger generation like Elizabeth Frink, uh, Lynn Chadwick, Robert Clatworthy. So there was this decision, I think, that Bolton would have this great collection of contemporary art and would be a beacon of culture across the Northwest. What do you think that tells us about, if you like, the mood of Bolton and its own self image at the time? I think it shows great confidence in the town that still this was a, a, a textile town. There was this sense that um, Bolton was a powerful industrial town and that the people of Bolton should access, have access to the greatest art mm. being made at that time. But the town had its own artists. Their canvas was made of grass, their frame the football field, and their Gainsborough the great Nat Lofthouse. In coronation year, Lofthouse took the Wanderers to Wembley to play in the FA Cup final. And as ever, what mattered to the nation was signalled by a royal presence. The Duke of Edinburgh meets the boys from Blackpool at Wembley before their cup final battle with Bolton Wanderers. From the royal box, Her Majesty the Queen watches the Duke shake hands with the white-shirted Wanderers who are making their fourth appearance at Wembley. Oh, we had some great players in the 50s. When I arrived eventually, a lot of the players were still talking about that team. It would be as big as like Man City, it may, maybe at that time even Man United. I mean, its supporters would be turning out in their thousands and thousands and thousands. Now Bolton get going smoothly. Hassel collects and passes. The ball goes to Nat Lofthouse. He shoots. Farm fumbles and it's a goal. Bolton have drawn first blood within 90 seconds. Right from the opening whistle, it looked as though it was going to be Bolton's day. But in the dying seconds, the cup was snatched from their grasp. A flip to centre finds Perry, who crashes it home into the Bolton net. Blackpool four, Bolton three. Here come the winners, gallant Blackpool, who turned what seemed defeat into one of the most dramatic victories ever seen at Wembley. 
Although Bolton would go on to win the FA Cup later that decade, the stumble at Wembley was perhaps an omen of what was to come. Within a generation, the bustling town would suffer a dramatic reversal of fortune. One of the key trends in post-war British history is deindustrialization, um, the decline of the manufacturing industries, shifting occupations. I've been mean, looking at the kind of jobs that people do now compared to the jobs that they were doing in 1952, 1953. There's an extraordinary difference. And, you know, and that's changed communities. It's changed places like Bolton. So we were straight onto the front street terraced and our house was actually collapsing. So it was showered up with big pieces of wood and it was collapsing into the old railway line. When it rained, we took the curtains in at the bottom because the rain came in through the windows. So when you look at 1984, 1990 even, and a lot of people still living like they were living in the 1950s shows the impact of how wages, jobs, the economic change was still affecting people 30 years after the mill started to close. Bury St Edmunds in the heart of East Anglia, for many the very picture of traditional England. This ancient market town with its medieval churches and ruined abbeys has been part of the royal story for more than a thousand years. So this is Liberty Silks on Linen and it depicts the death of St Edmund. Not very nice, is it? <laughs> Definitely not. It wouldn't want me to happen to you or me. The death of Edmund is commemorated in legend. He was shot full of arrows after being captured after losing a battle at Thetford. He was tied to a tree, refused to renounce his Christian faith, and then, for good measure, okay, cut his head off. He was buried at Hoxton, and it became a place of pilgrimage. And so much so, they moved him to the abbey here in Bury St Edmunds and became one of the biggest abbeys in Christendom. This town's story about itself is inseparable from the story of the sovereign. When the abbey itself was in existence, we had a, a lot of kings and queens come to Bury St Edmunds to pay homage to Edmund at the shrine, from um, Edward I right the way through to um, obviously today with the Queen Elizabeth. We all, we all love the Queen. I think if you've served, you, you've seen her, you've appreciated her, you've seen what service she's given to our nation. She came here for the Maundy service and she walked past us and handed out Maundy money. And everyone was so proud that day. The streets were lined with people and they all had special poses of flowers. The history and the legacy, I think, we all like as well. All, all that goes into all these different services. April, the annual St George's Day Parade. Brownies, cubs, scouts, guides on parade as they have been for a hundred years. The day is supposed to be a homage to St George, but when these young people pledge their allegiance, there's just one person who can claim their loyalty, and they really think of her as one of them. Tell me about what you guys have been doing today and what it's, what it's about, what does it mean? I think representing the girls and the girl guiding movement, and we're really honoured to have had the Queen as a brownie, a guide, and then a ranger herself. So it's about showing our voices and our representation. I think she's an icon for the British the oh, British wow. identity, and I think it's about women being able to be icons for themselves and for the communities that they live in and grow in and work in. What I love about this is that this is the kind of England that my parents would have recognised when they arrived here seven decades ago, just before the start of the Elizabethan reign. The symbols that we're seeing here, the music, the bands, the flags, were the same symbols that were used all over the empire. This film, taken on Coronation Day in 1953, bears a remarkable resemblance to the event today. The parade musters in the same place, 
before marching through the town on the same route. There were street parties going on. I, I know that at the um, top of the estates, there was a street party carried out just outside the large public house that used to be there. And I remember running after in a race an orange that was bowled across <laughs> the road. And for that, I got a Queen's coronation book. So that would have been your prize for winning the race. Uh, which I've still got somewhere at well, home. But not everything remains the same. At the time of the coronation, Berry relied on its fertile land to make a living. Farming in East Anglia is a highly mechanised industry and by far the most important source of livelihood. Like the cotton mills of Bolton, mechanisation was transforming an entire industry. But for the workers who remained, as in the mills, the hours were long, the wages meagre and the future uncertain. I mean, agricultural work is low paid, you know, and, and agriculture is changing in the post-war period. Partly this is coming out of transformations to given the reliance um, of the nation on agriculture during the war. But there's, you know, mechanisation and efficiency going on. So, you know, jobs in agriculture decline very steeply. A great deal of the sugar used in the British Isles comes from East Anglia. My father for most of his working life, he worked at the British Sugar Factory for the manufacture of and crushing of the sugar beet. Having food on the table was very important, but there wasn't any luxuries as such. People who grew up in the earlier 20th century, they never had the facilities. They never had proper bathrooms, they never had toilet facilities. You know, visiting the um, the privy at the bottom of the garden, you know, that sort of thing. But certainly after the Second World War and with rationing ending, people then started realising there was more to life they could enjoy. After feeding the nation, the new reign's first priority was obvious, homes. The young queen and her dashing husband, a war veteran, had their pick of palaces. But for their contemporaries, new homes had to be found in new places. Britain was on the move. It was fantastic to get a place. Well, I mean, we never dreamed of getting our own house, did we, in London? I don't know what we would have done if I hadn't come down here. I don't know where I would have gone or, or what, where my life would have gone. To me, it was, like, absolutely fantastic. I loved it. And you as well, really, because you'd lived in all them flats where you'd had to run yeah, up and down, haven't yeah. you, with your mum? Fifty years on, and not even a Suffolk shower can dampen Dave and Jean's certainty that they made the right move. Together, since the early 60s, they'd left London's East End for Bury at the end of the decade. Both found new jobs, and more importantly, a new council house, one of many which had sprung up in and around the town. I just moved into it quite easily. It was, it was so easy going. Um, and plus the fact I had all my friends from London come down with us. We adjusted very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did adjust very well, yeah. yeah. And the fact is, well, I had my mum and dad, they moved as well, and they were in, they lived in that row over there, number 11. I mean, they're not here now, bless them. What were your impressions of Bury when you got here as a place? It was a slower pace of life. Yeah. A slower pace of life, definitely. And you hadn't got... You couldn't get on a bus and go into the West End, which, when we were caught, and that was our weekend, we was always in the West End, you know, just get on the bus or the tube at Bethnal Green and, and go up west, you know. It was a lot um, slow, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a lot, life was oh, a lot yeah, slower. a lot slower. The arrival of thousands of outsiders like Jean and Dave accelerated the transformation of Bury from a sleepy market town to the affluent hub of today. I think the biggest mover for Berry Stebbins was the London overspill coming here in the late 1950s, 60s. Up till that, those periods, Berry Stebbins was reliant on agriculture. With the arrival of the London overspill, we also had the associated factories, the businesses, etc. We had large industrial estates built within the town. That was a big change. So gradually, people were starting to come to terms with modern day living. But it wasn't just Berry coming to terms with the modern world, it was the entire nation. A 
Across Britain, they were not just building houses, but whole new towns. Motorways brought communities closer together, and railway electrification slashed travel times. Every major city had new hospitals and schools. But the economic boom demanded more workers, builders, bus and train drivers, doctors, nurses. And the new Elizabethans had a ready answer. In theory, all the Queen's people belonged to one big happy imperial family. In practice, relations were strained from the start. You know, things wasn't nice at all. What we make do, for we can't go back home, for we don't have any money. You know, I worked in a place and there was this young white girl who told me to my face that black people's brains were small, like that. Does the answer to these Britishers' problems lie in Britain or in the West Indies? And yet perhaps, if we dig deep enough, we may find the solution hidden within the conscience of us all. Few in the empire had ever seen royalty in the flesh, but radio had carried the Queen's voice to millions. Now air travel brought her to many more. So we honoured the Queen because when I was about 12, the Queen came to Jamaica and we lined the streets and waved. As Sir Hugh Foote, the governor, greeted Jamaica's sovereign, the airfield became tense with eagerness, with wonder. The Queen once said, I have to be seen to be believed. Suddenly, she was able to make believers of entire nations. Well, we grown up in the colonial days. As a child in Jamaica, we celebrate Empire Day. And we all look forward to it. Loyalty, combined with curiosity, prompted many to take up the challenge of rebuilding the mother country. After all, what was England except another sister island under the same monarch and the same flag? My dad said, why does this child want to leave us? And my mom said, you know, she's no longer a child, you know, you have to let her go. In 1954, about 10,000 West Indians came to Britain. A few knew what to expect, but most of the women coming off boats in their hats and gloves and A-line skirts expected to set foot in the stylish royal England that they'd seen in the newsreels. In Jamaica, they didn't show us snow and things and soot, you know. When I came here, I said, this place, what? What is this place? The snow was like this, and you could see all the smoke in the skies because people were just burning coal fire. I was surprised, because you hear so much of England, the streets are paved with gold, basically. But you know, when you come and you see the houses, they weren't what I expected to see. It's a big change. We didn't have no felicity, no convenience. One room. Even when I had my first child, I was in one room. The market in Brixton is, for them, a happier place than a market in the tourist's paradise they have left. Many of the first arrivals from the West Indies settled here in South London. Over the following decade, they would be joined by others from all over the Commonwealth, many of whom found work in what is now held to be the greatest achievement of the Elizabethan age. The first job I had was in a laundry, and the second job was with the NHS in a maternity hospital in Barnet, when I spent 12 years in that job. So my first wages in St. Stephen Hospital was £2.50 a week. I lived in the nurse's home in South London. We just step across to the hospitals to look after our patients. And yes, it was a very um, good experience. That said, it took a while for the newcomers to grasp that some of Her Majesty's subjects were a little less equal than others. And that here, whatever the Bible said, not all God's children were welcome. We were the only two black people in the church, and they didn't take us up for communion. And after church, 
everybody, Vivica would come and greet everybody and Merry Christmas and things. And he just looked at us and passed by the vicar. And my, my, my cousin started to cry. So I said, forget it. Let's go home. I was the stronger one, even though I was the sick one. And when we went home, my grand-aunt said to me, Millie, she says, how did you like it? And I told her, she said, well, I wouldn't tell you. It's best for you to go and see for yourself. Something new and ugly raises its head in Britain. In Notting Hill Gate, only a mile or two from London's West End, racial violence. An angry crowd of youths chases a Negro into a greengrocer's shop, while police reinforcements are called up to check the riot, one of many that have broken out here in a few days. The archaic language can't hide the fact that this was a country ill at ease with itself. What should have been a new beginning was starting to look like the end of an era. What Britain saw at Notting Hill and the kind of hostility that Ruby experienced at this church behind me were perhaps early signs that the new queen, far from presiding over a second golden age, was in fact in for a bumpy ride. And it soon became clear that instead of ushering in a new Britain, she was actually seeing the collapse of the old one. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's Silver Jubilee. 25 eventful and glorious years. By the time of the Silver Jubilee in 1977, the crowd still turned out, but the national mood was darker. Her Majesty fires the fuse, which will set alight the first of a chain of Jubilee beacons. The optimism of those first years was replaced by strikes, factory closures and widespread job losses. The catastrophism preached by some, both left and right, made many wonder whether the glue that had kept a disparate nation together would hold much longer. Racial tension on Britain's streets was just one sign of the times, and for many, it had a powerful impact. By the time I hit secondary school, Enoch has made the Rivers of Blood speech, totally polarised the playground, and all of a sudden, I'm not, oi, let's see, I'm, oi, you black bastard, you this, you that, you know, go back home. This is my home. And uh, it not only polarised the playground, it polarised the whole landscape, man. Don Letts, rock star DJ, longtime pal, and rebel filmmaker. He first made his name telling the story of the alienated children of the Windrush generation. No, this ain't Kingston, Jamaica. This is London in the late 70s. Brixton, to be precise. Yes, the sun was shining, but the people were feeling the pressure all the same, black and white. The social climate was with mass unemployment, political turmoil, the rise of the National Front, and to top it off, constant grief from the police. I think what's really odd about that stuff is when I was growing up 13, 14, 15, it was normal. I kind of expected it. You know, if I was going to a movie, I'd always build in an extra half an hour because I'd know I'd get pulled up on the way to the movie. And there was times, you know, I, I developed kind of tactics to deal with the police, like you'd be driving along and they'd be tailing you from behind. I'd stop my car, get out of my car, walk up to them like, officer, can I help you? And it would totally <laughs> throw it in the best English. I can speak English better than these guys. Across town in another Britain, crowds were still flocking to that famous palace and its familiar balcony. The pageantry of monarchy survived, but seemed increasingly detached from much of the nation. Don Letts became the chronicler of the challenge to tradition. For a moment, Anarchy found its voice. The Sex Pistols' insistence that there was no future in England's dreaming caught the imagination. Punk rock was a minority taste. The radical spirit of the times infected even the nerdiest of young people. Anti-racism swept me into politics, 
It was probably the one thing most people could agree about. And amazingly, we found an ally in an institution that most young people thought was on its way out. When I was a student here, Britain seemed at its most angry and confrontational. And I guess I did my bit to fan the flames as president of the Student Union. I organized sit-ins and demonstrations pretty much non-stop for a year. But ironically, we, I suppose you could call us the coronation generation, found ourselves hand in hand with the royal family on at least one thing, <laughs> that Britain didn't have to be a nation divided by race. In Brixton, a generation had arrived thinking that they were already part of a nation under one sovereign. Their children grew up believing that that nation had rejected them. One institution had the power to reassure and to bridge the divide. And it's a responsibility embraced by those who will wear the crown in times to come. June 22nd, the second in line to the throne comes to Brixton to mark Windrush Day. The Windrush voyagers came to rebuild Britain alongside his grandmother's generation. One day, their descendants will work alongside William and Kate. They're getting to know us, like, asking us about what we're doing, like, what we're interested in, and, yeah, I think that's why it was, like, a really important time. It makes us feel like all oh, these guys aren't just those people that are... They're disconnected. They, we felt connected. William carried a message from Her Majesty that drew a line from the past to the future. Alongside celebrating the diverse fabric of our families, our communities and our society as a whole. Something the Windrush generation has contributed so much to. It is also important to acknowledge the ways in which the future they sought and deserved has yet to come to pass. We are reminded of our shared history and the enormous contribution of the Windrush generation. Without you all, Britain would simply not be what it is today. At the time of the coronation, the future of Bolton as an industrial powerhouse seemed secure and a whole generation of youngsters was destined for a career in cotton. Inside the modern mill, a great transformation is taking place. A progressive industry needs progressive workers. It needs trained technicians. But the brave new world was short-lived, and within a generation, cotton was dead on its feet. You could see the hive of industry from the hills, a pile of smoking, choking smoke hung all around. Buying from abroad then came around. Imported goods became the fashion and killed the life and soul of every cotton town. We were about 22 there, maybe. And Bolton bard Dot Thornley spent all her working life in the mills. And your problems when you're she now lives comfortably with her daughter Carol but for much of their earlier lives, when the industry collapsed, both mother and daughter suffered extreme poverty. I grew up in 1984. We didn't even have an indoor toilet. We had to go through the snow to get to the toilet. And we're not going back to the 1950s that my mum knew of. And this is 1984 when I was 16. Um, and a lot of people lived like that. Like millions of working class women, Carol was destined for a series of dead-end jobs and domestic drudgery, until one day, all that changed. I was about 21 and thought my life was over other than having babies, as my dad said I should have. And then someone suggested, well, why don't you look at university? The cotton mills may have closed, but the old Bolton Technical College has adapted over the years. At the beginning of the period we're talking about, the percentage of the British population who went to university was tiny. And now it's something that, you know, lots of people now think, yes, that's something I can do. That opportunity has really opened up for people over the last kind of 70, 80 years. Carol was one of those who took the opportunity 
and after four years, she graduated with a degree in education. I was now a teacher and I can't explain. It's like a woman who wants to have a child and eventually gets pregnant. When you have a burning ambition inside you and then you suddenly fulfill it at 26, that's what Bolton University did for me. It provided me with my future career. Today, the university has more than 11,000 students, two thirds of whom come from Bolton and the Northwest. It plays a crucial role in training the next generation of nurses and paramedics for one of the country's great post-war success stories, the National Health Service. Get him across. Steady, steady. Have you guys... Whoa, 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 whoa! What's happened there? Come on. We employ uh, nearly 6,000 staff in the NHS. Take a hand over, team, listen up. They live in Bolton, their families live in Bolton. Healthcare is one of the only growing industries, really, at the moment. Right, so the patient is not responding. OK, has he got a pulse? We work with the university to make sure that we can have qualifications and training places in this hospital. All right, OK, so I've got a pulse. I'm going to check the circulation. And that's the way that we'll keep our hospital fresh and alive and serve in this community. You've done really well. When the patients on this ward were born, the single biggest employer here was the cotton industry. No one could have foreseen a world in which medicine would replace the mill as the lifeblood of an entire community. The Queen's crimson robe is removed. In the 70 years since the coronation, the scale of change in Bolton has been unimaginable. But in all that time, enthusiasm for the Queen remained undiminished. I think she's brilliant. I think it, she, it must be hard work doing what she's done. The Archbishop anoints her with holy oil and consecrates her to her great office. I'm very proud of her. Yes, I think she's, I think she's a good lady. She receives the orb, symbol of the dominion of the cross over the world. I think the royal family are really important, but the Queen, by far, is, is the most important person to our country. Change over time is, of course, inevitable. But in the rural heartlands of England, where the roots of community stretch back long before the Industrial Revolution, the pace of that change has been just a little bit slower. A visitor from the Bury St Edmunds of the 1950s would instantly recognise this place with its quiet affluence, its neat churches, its ethos of military service. There are many more people here now. There's a lot more hustle and bustle. But this town, in essence, remains a microcosm of the nation that Queen Elizabeth pledged to serve all those many years ago. And the one thing that certainly hasn't changed in Bury is a shared sense of history. A tradition of royal service and devotion that has stretched back for centuries. For our first prayer, I'm going to invite you all to put your hands together like you'd see a picture of somebody praying traditionally. It is a love that is modelled for us by the Queen. The Queen who is in her own way a giant of faith, who acts with integrity, care and respect for those around her. I mean, she is our history, and we've held on to that. I think, I, I think she's done an absolute marvellous job. Considering absolute all the pressure job. she's been under. I mean, she couldn't walk away from it, could she? No, there not There was really. no way out for her. She, that's her. That was her life. And as she said right at the beginning, I will give everything to being a queen. Mm. And yeah, and I she, think she's done a great she job. She has. Most of Britain has only ever known one monarch. We had no choice, like her, we were born to it. But over a tumultuous seven decades, even those who dislike the institution have come to celebrate, even to love the person. The men and women of the Windrush generation did have a choice, most expected to return to the Caribbean one day. 
And there were many who would gladly have waved them off our shores, but they stayed. I love it now because I don't know other, any other life. Because I came here quite young, so I adapt myself to the culture of this country. I just take what I get and enjoy. I go back for holiday, but I, my home is still in England. I'm glad that I came here. And this country been very, very, very good to me. And I love this country and I'm not going home and I'm not going nowhere else. Pretty much everybody here came to this country from somewhere else and most have lived through the entire Elizabethan reign. For many, this country didn't turn out to be the place they expected, and not in a good way. But what is really striking is that nobody I've talked to regrets coming and staying. And most telling of all, when they talk about home, they're not talking about the old country. They're talking about Brixton. Across the span of one remarkable lifetime, this country has been transformed. The lesson of those seven decades? Well, for me, that a nation secure in the symbols of continuity need have no fear of change in the reality. Maybe the magic of this age of Elizabeth is not the past that she preserved, but the future that she has secured. And that is cause for praise, thanksgiving and celebration.